or uh, local areas. So uh, we're excited you're here. Uh, we're always looking for ideas and feedback of how we can do this better. Uh, hopefully this goes well of trying to uh, make hybrid work for folks. Uh, and so I will, oh, one quick announcement. So we will have uh, the State of Science group in June, the first Friday in June, likely in person again. Uh, and then we'll take July and August off. So we'll meet in June, but not in July and August. Uh, that's the one we're going to So I'm going to hand it over to Sam now. So Sam uh, is uh, going to be introducing our uh, presenters throughout uh, the session. So take it away, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Sam. I'm the director of what's called an iData in the uh, Geese Business School. Um, within the Geese Business School, there's this unit called Disruption Innovation Unit. And what that does is basically bring all the emerging technology into business school. And we have student projects um, throughout the semester to uh, kind of, uh, one is to, to bring the emerging tech to the business world. And second is to, to uh, get the students involved in real world projects. So we start off with uh, kind of data science and AI. That's a little bit more on the mature end of things. And now we're getting into blockchains and uh, crypto and uh, AR, VR and quantum computing. So it's like a lot of stuff that's going on, but it's, it's been a lot of fun. So today I have the pleasure of having three uh, student teams presenting um, on the multiple different topics uh, that they've worked on uh, over either last semester or for like about two or three semesters. So um, I'll ask the students to introduce themselves. Uh, they're very, very good at it. Uh, Vedi, you want to take it away? So this is the Crypto Invest team. Um, little brief agenda for today is I'll introduce myself, then we'll talk a bit about how we're sourcing our data and cleaning the data, as well as building redundancy into our algorithm to ensure that even when automated, there's no problems um, for for day-to-day -day use. Then we'll get into a bit about what we do with the data, um, how we calculate the mega factor, which is our big trade signal generation. So how we trade certain cryptocurrencies, then we'll analyze what we've done so far, talk about next steps and how we hope to use the new like breakthrough data types that are coming around and then we'll conclude. So like I said, I'm Vedanand, the project manager, as well as the tech lead for this project. And I'm a sophomore studying computer science and statistics. So in terms of APIs, just a general overview. So every morning at 8 a.m., we make a API call to get the top 10 cryptocurrencies by market cap. Then we clean that data to ensure that we're not using any stable coins or any meme coins, as they call it, the very volatile ones. And then from there, what we do is we have three different APIs that we're using. The first one is CoinGecko. This is the primary because it's incredibly reliable. It's only been down like three times in the last seven years. And the data that it outputs exactly fits our use case. So we don't have to clean it at all. And the data we're looking for is the date, the ticker for the cryptocurrency, the price of the cryptocurrency for that day, as, and then the market cap. And then the next API that we have, which is our secondary. So if CoinGecko throws an error, we go to KuCoin. And this one's slightly more difficult to work with as it isn't an exchange API, but so it, it requires a bit more cleaning, but it has much more valuable data types, but we might not need those day to day. And then the third one I'll talk about a bit later, but that's the new breakthrough API that's giving us access to on-chain as well as market data and other indicators that we can use for our next steps. So in terms of mega factor calculation, we have four main calculations. The first one is the momentum, which is just a simple ratio of current price to previous price. And we calculate four different day intervals, which is the 15 day, 20 day, 25 day, and the 30 day. And then we average. And then the moving average is because we know the cryptocurrency market is so volatile, we average that to smooth it over, over a recent window. And then that just helps us reduce variations. And then rolling days is just a simple, how many days has it been since the last peak of the cryptocurrency price? And then that's just a 
really simple indicator for short-term trends. And then we combine these factors to get the mega factor. And the mega factor is the top five with the highest mega factors are our worst performing. And the lowest five mega factors are our best performing. So we long the lowest ones and short the highest ones. So here's some sharp scores, which is the analysis of our algorithm. Um, originally, we were at 1.99, so around two, which is almost two times more return, adjusted return as compared to the risk level that you're undertaking. And then that original algorithm was not had a set top 10 market cap that we were looking at every day. But now that we're making calls every day, that top 10 might change. And through some other improvements, we're at a sharp score of almost 2.3, and we hope to improve that even further. Only issue is that currently, recently, the market's been in a significant downtrend. So we know that it works very well in the downtrend, but we're not exactly sure how it works on the uptrend. So that's something that we have to take into account. So in terms of next steps, we have two main ways we want to push this forward. First is using on-chain metrics, and that is metrics on the blockchain. So we'd be looking at things such as active wallets or how much Bitcoin is moving in a day on the blockchain and things like that. And that'll help us to make our trade signal generation even more robust. And then obviously we would like to use machine learning to improve our look back period. Currently we have it set to 15, 20, 25, and 30, but if we can um, optimize that, then that would be even more beneficial. And here are just a couple of on-chain data metrics that we think are really exciting. And this type of data is not available in traditional finance. That's why this is so significant, but we'd be looking at things such as exchange balance, so exchange balance is how much cryptocurrency is available in wallets that are associated with exchanges. So think Coinbase, KuCoin, things like that. And so less supply usually on exchanges means obviously lower liquidity, which is more, more volatile price, which would lead to a less confident signal. And then if there's high liquidity, that's a pretty active market so it'd be a decent market to enter just to make our algorithm even more robust and then finally we have nupl or net unrealized profit loss and this is the really significant one um, it analyzes phases of the market cycle so wherever you see red that's usually a downtrend because the major bear market lows are often marked with heavy capitulation so there's more sell pressure which means more holders or owners of in this case bitcoin are in loss as compared to in profit awesome so that was a data oriented look into our project for this semester uh, mm -hmm. thank you for listening uh, any questions Hi. Um, i'm just curious this process could you run it against any Commodity stocks and any sort of portfolio of traded items? You could with slight changes. I think the algorithm probably applies the exact, not even probably, it does apply the exact same to traditional finance. We've just made some adjustments to account for how the crypto market is different from the stock market, for example, because stock market is only open for certain, certain hours every day and certain days of the week, whereas the crypto market is 24 seven, seven days a week. So with some changes you could, because the algorithm stays the same. So yeah. Maybe, let me just jump in real quick. This thing, uh, even the first version that the students um, were building is performing really fantastically. Um, we started trading it in uh, real money since October 7th last year. And it's been at about 1% volatility, given um, a 12% return since then. So just last night, I checked, it was like about 0.99 fall. And I'm like really happy because if you look at the, the uh, hedge fund industry, 
doesn't matter if it's an equity or, or fixed income or commodity, we're looking at, you know, much higher form. Compared to holder of BTC and ETH, we're looking at about 3.5 to 3.98 uh, vol, uh, given a loss since October 7th. So this is top 10 market cap. I think it's intended as a product to basically introduce exposure to the crypto market without the heart attack, right? So, so people want to buy in and stuff like that. Uh, a couple of things maybe to mention is, you know, people are interested in this, like, oh, we can start a fund uh, to, to, uh, to trade this thing. It turned out to be in the regulation type of environment, for, at least for the United States, it's a little hard because in the short positions, we're shorting the perpetual futures, uh, the long, long spot market. So right now in the United States, uh, all the coins listed on Coinbase and whatever, these are considered uh, non-secured tokens. Otherwise, SEC will have their hands on everything. Um, and a lot of times you cannot really short the coin. You can only long them. That's why people just hold them. You can't really, like, at least legally, <laughs> you cannot really trade the perpetual futures for the short. So to open a market like this to the American uh, investors, you are looking at an offshore vehicle and then open it up to the um, qualified uh, investors under some sort of um, private placement number, at least for now. So let's see what happens uh, next year. All right, uh, thank you very much, Vet. Maybe we'll pass the, the presentation to Ashna and Adit and please start off with the introduction. All right, cool. Um, so we're the subprime auto loan team. Um, yeah, so in this presentation, we are going to talk about kind of our development process for building out um, some machine learning tools to actually predict sub, uh, subprime auto loans and classification. So on the agenda for today, we'll start off with the team overview um, and then go into kind of our vision statement and timeline for actually creating these models. And then we'll go into kind of some of the specifics of two pipelines that we built out for the two tools, which were the machine learning model and the NLP tools. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the more specific changes that we made from the last two semesters as this is a continuing project. Um, and then finally, we'll end off with going over the actual performance of these models, as well as some future steps that we'd like to take. So um, just briefly going over the team overview, um, unfortunately, most of the team isn't here with us today, but it's going to be me and Audit on behalf of the team. Um, so we can go ahead and introduce ourselves. My name's Ashna. I'm a senior manager for this project, and I'm a sophomore studying computer science. And hey, guys, my name is Audit. I'm the project manager for this project, and I'm also a sophomore in computer science. All right, so first we'll start off with going over the overview of the project as well as the timeline. So just to give you some context, um, our client is a subprime auto lender in the Ohio metric area. And essentially they're facing problems with customers negotiating loans in bad faith. And this is a problem because it ends up putting the client in a bad position. Um, and so they came to, the, to us in order to actually build out a quantitative way to help them evaluate these customers to prevent uh, taking on loans that people might default on. So in order to do this, we built out two main tools, the first being a machine learning model and the second being a natural language processing model. And there are kind of three main steps that we wanted to complete in order to actually oversee um, the building of this tool. So the first is the actual model building and optimization. So this is just building out the actual two machine learning and NLP models, um, as well as doing all the hyperparameter tuning and optimization. Um, the second step is database automation. And this is specifically because it's a client facing project and we wanted to ensure that it's super easy for the client to actually use our tool in practice. Um, and then finally, the last step was anomaly detection. Um, and the reason behind this is kind of to actually pull together the significance and usability of our tool as well. So rather than just having these raw scores um, for risk that the client can see, we wanted to actually build a system that detects changes in these scores to actually help the client flag anything that's unusual. Um, and now I'll go ahead and pass it off to you, Audit, to talk a little bit more about the specifics of our project timeline. Yeah, so um, for this semester, we, uh, we're kind of picking off um, from like the last semester's work. 
And so kind of what our first main goal was to kind of fix these, this ML model pipeline that was built last semester. Um, there was a, a lot of broken code and some automation that really just didn't work. So that was kind of the first six or so weeks of um, project development, just making sure that was all fixed and working. Then after that, we kind of moved into this optimization um, side of the project where we kind of tried to work on making the ML and the NLP models as good as they could be. Then we had tried different techniques, tried different models, reduced the bias. And as we will see later on, we'll see kind of look at the results of that. And then kind of continuing onward, we had uh, we wanted to go into automation and the anomaly detection. Um, you know, as the project, we ran into some issues uh, with like adding another data source and stuff like that. So we weren't able to kind of completely finish those last two parts. Um, and that's something kind of like we're looking towards in future scoping. But um, yeah, it's uh, it was a great semester of work. And so yeah, next we'll just kind of quickly go over the um, ML pipeline and what that what that looks like. So um, and so we have the kind of, we have kind of two parts of the ML pipeline. It's there's the training and the prediction. So this model was the model that we kind of built off was was using a LG Boost architecture, and to kind of um, get all of this the training pipeline working, we kind of have three big data sources. And so first is a, um, a third party risk data provider that our client uses that provides kind of risk metrics for um, customers. Second is our like the Omega data, which is simply like our clients uh, backend database that has a lot of the um, kind of intangibles about a customer. And um, the final thing is just another kind of uh, credit bureau data source um, that has like stuff like credit scores and stuff for a customer. So kind of the three of these um, sources make up all of our training data. So there's a lot of um, you know feature extraction, pre-processing to make sure, make sure it's all clean. And we take this training data, pass it into our LG Boost model, and then um, we're kind of outputted with the model. For the prediction side of things, we um, the customer, I'm uh, sorry, our client provides us with like a group of customers that they want us to predict. We go ahead and pull the necessary data um, in order to build like this data set. And then our LG Boost model uh, outputs a profitability profitability metric for each of these customers. And the profitability metric is really just a binary value saying, you know, zero if we think this customer is someone um, who will be uh, who won't be profitable for their, for our client, and one is someone who who would be. And um, yeah, next I will pass pass it off to Ashna to talk more about the NLP pipeline. Yeah, thanks, Audit. So uh, just to reiterate, the first of the two tools was a machine learning model. Um, we use the LG Boost model, and essentially it just took in a bunch of data regarding a customer's past transaction history and credit history, um, and then it output a profitability metric. Um, so kind of moving forward to the second of the two models, um, it was a natural language processing tool. So um, I'll go ahead and go into the pipeline for that now. So for the natural language processing tool, we utilize the custom classifier on AWS Comprehend. Um, and essentially this output a binary classification of whether or not we thought the customer would charge off. Um, and similarly, we had two separate pipelines for trainings and for training the model as well as predictions um, separately. And this was also to just ensure that the client could retrain the model whenever there were significant changes to the training data um, as to reflect that in the new predictions. So kind of going into the training pipeline first, um, the input data to this model was customer notes took by employees um, regarding any transactions. And then for pre-processing, we found that the main thing that made a significant difference was actually acronym translation. Um, this was kind of interesting as usually with a lot of NLP projects, um, there's a lot of typical pre-processing steps that people take, um, such as stop word removal, um, that kind of thing. However, with this project, when we actually went into the notes and looked at the raw data, we noticed that, that there were a lot of shorthand words that these employees use that obviously the model wouldn't be able to pick up on. And so for that reason, we kind of took a different route with the pre-processing. Um, and that's where the acronym translation came in. So it was pretty much just a dictionary that translated out these shorthand um, or slang terms into their full um, words. So that kind of consisted of the training data for this model. Um, and then when we were generating predictions, we again took in customer notes, um, sent that through the Comprehend model. And then this model was actually predicted 
you know, charge off metric, which is a little bit different to the other one. Um, so it's, again, like I said before, a binary classification of whether or not uh, the customer is likely to charge off based off of those notes. Um, and I think overall the goal here was to kind of pick up on the nuances that you might not realize through just numbers and stats regarding a customer that you may be able to pick up on through customer notes or some sort of unstructured data. All right, um, so now that we've kind of gone, gone over the first, the two main models um, to this tool, um, I wanna pass it off to Audit to actually talk about one of the key changes that we made to this project regarding a whole third model that we ended up scrapping. So yeah, if you guys remember from one of the previous the previous slide about the ML model, one of the one of the kind of data sources we were using is the credit bureau data. And so what our original um, approach from last semester is that um, was that since this credit bureau data was kind of formatted in this kind of monthly uh, like kind of time series way, as in you know we had data for customers like for each month, you know January, February, March, and so on, so so forth. So what we were originally doing was we actually developed a time series model to, um, that took in this credit bureau data and then that would kind of output um, a kind of um, a binary classification. And then we use this output of this time series uh, model as an input to our ML model and then kind of trained, in our, trained our ML model that way. But uh, one of the big things we noticed, big issues was that our credit bureau data was extremely biased. Since we really only had that for like a few months worth of data, the overwhelming majority of the data points and um, rows in that data were like positive values. And then we had very little negative values, meaning uh, most of the customers were like customers who were good and profitable. And th there was very few data, uh, like credit bureau data about customers who weren't. And this was like as a result of, you know, um, like this data only really being available very recently. And um, yeah, and then like only being able to pull it for active accounts, which like the overwhelming majority of active accounts were still considered good. So as a result, this model was like deemed to be extremely biased. So kind of our, our solution for this was to move away from using this time series model that like had some very, very obvious bias and instead kind of um, start looking, uh, transforming this credit bureau data into some um, statistical metrics. So the two we kind of chose here were trend and weighted average. As we, chose, as we thought, you know, um, a trend in like a customer's credit score and also kind of their weighted average, meaning weighting like their most recent credit scores more um, and like their like past credit scores a little bit less. We felt that these two metrics kind of better represented uh, the, the types of data, like a feature for our ML model rather than just kind of binary output from a very extremely biased model. And for the time being, um, this is kind of our solution and you know once we once there's enough data we're like there's it's not such a crazy um difference between negative and positive data points then a time series model can definitely be used but um for the time being uh we decided to kind of go with this approach and so yeah next i'll pass, pass it off to ash to talk about fixing the nlp bias all right, thanks, Audit. Um, so yeah, uh, going back to the NLP model that we were talking about, um, one of the main issues we actually ran into after building out the initial model and getting the metrics and performance on that, we found that there was a huge data imbalance. Um, and this was actually affecting the model in terms of accurate, not accuracy, but more in terms of like precision and the F1 score. So if you can see below the table, we have the total number of data points, and then we have this broken down into the percentage of good versus bad data points, um, as this was the binary classification. And as you can see, it's super heavily skewed towards the good data points. Um, and when you're training a model like this, the training data heavily influences the performance of the actual model when you're running predictions. And so what we ended up finding was that when the act, when we got the accuracy of the model, it was pretty high, almost 91% actually. However, the F1 score was significantly below that by almost 15 to 20%. Um, and so we, one of the major goals we had this semester was also kind of just fixing that. So our goal or our approach with this was to explore a bunch of data resampling techniques to kind of reduce this data imbalance that was the root cause of 
the gap between the accuracy and the F1 score. Um, and so, as you can see, the original ratio of good to bad points or good to bad um, customer accounts was around 83 to 18. Um, and so we kind of talked to the client to see, to get a gauge for what the actual percentage or what the actual ratio was uh, when he was looking at the actual data and metrics on his own customers. And after talking to him, we found that it was around 70-30. And so then we kind of took this information and proceeded to uh, resample the data in order to actually match this ratio. And after doing that, we actually found that this helped tremendously. So as we can see on the left, the accuracy of the original model without the data imbalance correction was pretty high, around 91%. However, the F1 score, um, which is just a harmonic mean of the precision and recall was significantly lower, um, around 74%. And after we implemented this um, data resampling bias correction, the accuracy decreased a little bit. However, the F1 score actually jumped significantly. And this is what we wanted, um, especially with this, when we're predicting um, whether an account is likely to charge off or not. We thought it's more important to um, look at the actual like precision um, of how important is it, how, how how many, uh, what, or sorry, what would be the consequences of the model wrongly flagging a good account as bad versus flagging a bad account as good? Um, and so ultimately, after implementing this bias correction, we were pretty happy with the um, performance of this model, despite the slight drop in accuracy. All right, um, and I will pass it back to Audit to talk a little bit about the performance of the machine learning model. Thank you, Ashna. So um, basically kind of our goal for this for the ML model was to you know, uh, maximize the true positive and true negative values. So really we went about it by experimenting with a variety of different uh, models. We also um, you know, use different resources to determine which uh, model would be the best. And um, yeah, this was all in, in order to optimize like the accuracy, precision and F1 score. So out of all of the models we, we evaluated, um, LG Boost ended up being the most, uh, like in terms of kind of all, all a combination of all of these three, the best. And um, yeah, I think the next slide, yeah. And so our accuracy for this model um, was 74%. And although that may not seem like amazing, um, industry standards for this type of data are around 70, 90%. So we fall well within that range. Um, our precision was also uh, not, not as high, it was 71%. And our F1 score was, was relatively decent, around 82%. So um, overall, this I think this the model like fell well within like kind of industry standards for this data. And I think as the model kind of continues to grow from more uh, like more data and uh, more data points, then it'll continue to improve in terms of accuracy and precision. And yeah, finally, um, I think Asha will talk about some future scoping. Yeah, thanks, Anid. Um, so yeah, now that we've kind of gone, now that we've gone over the model building optimization as well as the performance of these two models, um, the last thing we want to talk about is some of the remaining work um, and a look into what we hope to do with this project in the future or actually this upcoming semester. All right, so pretty much to recap, what we have accomplished this semester is fully building out and optimizing both pipelines for the NLP model and the machine learning model. Um, and the two major components left of this project in order to actually elevate it from being a tool that um, helps quantitatively, quantitatively evaluate borrowers to actually making it usable in industry is actually getting this automation um, and this risk detection. So next semester, we plan on actually implementing a full circle automation to ensure that the client can easily use our tool without having to perform all these intermediate steps and going into the AWS environment um, itself. So for the database automation, um, the main, it's gonna be a 180 um, process. So basically our goal is to automatically pull data um, put that, feed that directly into the model for both training and prediction, and then ultimately feed those predictions back to the original database so that the client can see those scores um, right next to all the other metrics of that customer. 
Um, so this basically consists of automating the entire process of both pulling and pushing from their database, as I mentioned. Um, and we hope to trigger this based off of some time-based frequency um, so they don't have to manually kind of trigger this training or prediction. And then secondly, regarding the anomaly detection, um, after actually building out these tools and getting these scores for each customer, uh, we want to create some sort of system that actually gauges trends in customer scores over time, which I think is much more meaningful than looking at static data points um, in time. Um, so this is kind of what we mean when we talk about anomaly detection. And after looking at these trends, we'll be able to kind of flag customers that have a super unusual drop in their scores over time. Um, and this will be super helpful for the client to actually go in and pinpoint those customers that may be falling behind. Um, and then they can kind of use that as like a preventative measure in the future to prevent charge offs, which is the ultimate goal. All right, um, and that concluded our presentation. And now we wanna open the floor to any questions. Hi, uh, this is she. I'm joining online. I have, uh, by the way, this is a pretty cool project. Uh, I have two questions. The first one uh, is regarding the dictionary quote uh, you built for the acronym pre-processing. I wonder, is that built manually or the, the team has a way to automate the process, for example, to translate the abbreviation to uh, something else in the standard quote format? And the second question is, uh, I'm just curious what kinds of other models are being evaluated? Uh, that's it, thank you. Yeah, sure. So for the first question regarding the acronym dictionary, um, the way we did this originally um, to actually create the dictionary in the first round, we went to the client and actually just asked all of their, or the employees responsible for note-taking to actually just give us a list of their top 15 acronyms that each of them use. And then we had them like map that to the full translation. So that was kind of the starting point for the dictionary. Um, however, after that, we uploaded that into the AWS environment and that file kind of just sits in a bucket. And so what basically happens is anytime that we want to update the dictionary, we just have to update that CSV file um, with the additional terms or slang that the employees might use and the pipeline automatically will um, use the updated dictionary. But for your question, I guess, regarding the creation of it, um, that process was act that process was pretty manual. Um, I think there's no other way other than going straight to the employees and having them directly map out the translation of the acronyms that they use. And yeah, I can just quickly talk about um, the, the models and stuff. So um, we what we ended up uh, doing is we kind of uploaded the data that we were using to the model to um, a, a site called Data Robot. And that's the, that's the kind of site that looks at the data and kind of tells you which is the best uh, best model that will get the data. So the majority of the, the best one it said was LG Boost. And we experimented with a few other types of decision tree uh, based models with like XG Boost and um, other models. But um, yeah, it was LG Boost is the one that ended up performing the best. Thank you. That's a uh, pretty cool. Did you check if your output variable and any of your errors with social demographic features. I'm really interested in simple, race, and So yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, so one of the one of the really big important things with this project is that you know we have to be like compliant with a lot of the um and stuff. And so for for that, that means um we were like we well, is not trained on any type of um, like personal like identifying demographic information, so it doesn't take in anything, any data about um, like um, address, uh, race, gender, anything like that. It's purely just on the uh, financial metrics of a person. All right, thanks for clarifying on that. So I, I would recommend maybe with your customer looking into that, these, these automated loan prediction tools have been heavily criticized over the last years on systematically discriminating against certain social demographic features and the intersectionality. 
um, especially since you have a minority class, right? Of um, you had a minority class of um, loan defaulting, which you statistically oversampled, which means you feed back any minorities. Um, patterns into the model and then the model gets bigger with those. So that's something I would probably recommend paying attention to. And the other thing um, you might want to you know, think about is how much automation do you really want to achieve? It's nice if the whole thing is fully automated, but in the end, these are very real world impacts for people. They do or do not get a loan. And if you have a machine fully doing that, it will learn from whatever you know, false positives and negatives are in your model. Whereas if you have a human check somewhere in the loop, ideally not at the very end, but probably too, um, that would help to um, address some of these systematic issues that are um, correlated with people features. Thank you. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah thank, you, thank you. I think one thing to just kind of clarify on that end is that uh, this tool is not going to be like like kind of like a like for our client. It's not like a like a set and done thing. It's not like if this outputs a zero or one. That's exactly what the client will look at. It's more of a kind of tool in, the, in, our, in our client's arsenal to kind of help with their uh, loans. Yeah, um, thanks for the presentation. I have a quick question. How do you combine the outcome of uh, these two models, like NLP versus LGB? Uh, and what if, if they conflict, like one of them says that's a bad um, customer, the other one says that's a, that's a good one. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, the, the the kind of interesting thing there is that they're actually trained on kind of two different um, like kind of Y values. The the ML, and this was kind of based on the original data that we were provided. The ML model is trained on this kind of to, uh, to predict this profitability metric. And so this is purely like kind of a financial thing on whether or not our client will be like making, whether or not we think our client will be making money um like a, a certain amount of profit on a certain customer whereas the nlp is trained on just like whether or not a customer will charge off and there's kind of this interesting thing where a customer can charge off like pretty late into their loan cycle and still be profitable so um that was kind of the one thing that something major we kind of discovered like this semester kind of um and that, that was just really a, as a result of the, the way that we were like kind of the um, how we were given the data. But um, it's definitely within the realm of possibility that like these two, um, that the two, the two things, uh, the two models can conflict. Um, and I guess it's, we've, it's really up to the client on how they kind of interpret this data. Thank you, Ashita. Thank you, Ardeep. Um, let's uh, move on to the last presentation from uh, Jeremy. Maybe before Jeremy starts, let's uh, give a shout out to Robert uh, Brunner. He's our uh, uh, leader here at the Disruption Innovation Unit. And he's made uh, numerous sacrifices for us to get the projects done and bringing in lots of interesting projects for us. And this last one is um, also on the Robert's, um, uh, his own data. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Jeremy and uh, we did the uh, twin project. So that's a, we use kind of open source defect technology from a lot of different repos. And so we get, as uh, Samuel was saying, we uh, get video from uh, Professor Brunner, who is, um, and we, from that, we use like deep learning to try to find patterns in how they speak and try to replicate him. Um, so here's our team, uh, it's me. Uh, Eamon, um, who's a PhD in informatics, and uh, Tyler Kim, who's uh, in computer science. Um, so what even is the deep fake? Because I think deep fakes have a pretty bad rep right now. Um, so they're basically, it's a synthetic media where a person um, is kind of replaced by, it's not actually them speaking. Um, so a lot of people think like they create misinformation and uh, fraud which, you know, they can do that, but like every technology it can kind of be used for good and bad. So we wanted to showcase how um, it could be used for good because, you know, it's always going to get better as every technology does. So as long as it's getting better, rather than almost helping it get better, we were trying to focus on finding a very positive application for it. Um, so yeah, here's some of the more famous deep fakes. I think the best example is uh, the Korean election. Um, there was a, the, the candidate created a deep fake to make himself like more charismatic as kind of like an avatar for himself. And everyone knew it was a deep fake, so it wasn't a misinformation problem, but like the opposing candidate was furious. And then two weeks later, he creates his own deep fake. So it's like, a, it's just gonna keep getting better. So 
Um, so here's a video um, we completed. Um, so this is uh, President Brunner speaking to the nation. Thank you very much, Mr. President. You know, four years ago, uh, following the most devastating attack in our history, uh, this body passed the USA Patriot Act in order to give our nation's law enforcement the tools they needed to track down terrorists who plot and lurk within our own borders and all over the world. Um, so, yeah, so, and uh, here is uh, the audio. So this is uh, for a virtual graduation, uh, which I'll explain later why that's a good use case of this. Jamie Ritter, Elena Gao, Sumeda Kordise, Bash Noel Rio, Ertaz Usafuddin, Karul Vermat, Kirish Nawrayu, Valerie Rewer Batinsky. Uh, yeah, so basically, um, those two could be combined and create basically a graduation video um, of Robert speaking. Um, so for the more technical details, so we use the open source libraries web, uh, wave to lip for the video. So that library basically takes in a picture and it based on like how other people speak, uh, it basically, so it wasn't even a video, it's just you can take a picture and it will model as if you're actually speaking. Um, and then for the audio, we used uh, your TTS, which uh, is based on a bunch of different different models, um, which we modified a bit. Um, and then so with that, we were able to create audio uh, where uh, just from text, basically, and a couple, we used like 15 minutes of Robert speaking, which wasn't even high def, to be honest. Um, so yeah, so basically the audio library is zero shot. Um, so that means that like, based on very little data, you're able to create results. Like a lot of the other deep fakes um, use like a ton of data from the actual speaker, but the speaker wasn't even in the, the training set. So it basically pattern matches from there, even though Robert wasn't in the training data. Um, and it, we, it only needs like 60 seconds for results, but as I said, we gave it like 15 minutes. Um, and it used the VCTK data set, um, which was, it contains a lot of speakers. Um, we basically use their model for it. Um, and yeah, so uh, I guess um, some future plans. Um, also, uh, I forgot to say this, but the reason, so graduation is really good because it's a task that like a lot of um, people were saying that like they don't do, they don't have the faculty say like graduation stuff, even though um, be just because it's so time consuming um, to, cause you know, you need to like, there's so many different names and need to wait like 30 minutes but it's something that people really like to have their own kind of name setting graduation so it's kind of the perfect task for this um so we'd love to improve our project and make it more user friendly right now we have to make it for this like specific use case but we want to kind of generalize it in the future a little bit more um and we'd like to even make it software as a service a bit um because we have some nice hardware um so i think that's a potential use case in the future and I think the best example is that we can people like the guy that says stand clear the closing doors on the subway. Like if that could be done in different languages, um, it could that would be, I think, a really nice application of it. Um, so stuff like that, um, it's pretty limitless, like the applications for this technology. So we're kind of excited to discover more stuff. Well, let's do it. Thanks to uh, all the students. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Let's <laughs> Yeah, thank you to the students uh, online and, and here as well. Thank you for the presentations. We're excited to be back and offer this hybrid. Uh, we'll keep trying this out and uh, see how it goes. So please provide uh, any feedback that you have or any ideas for future sessions. We will be back the first Friday in June. So thank you all for attending. Enjoy the rest of your day.